uh, to our first morning events. Uh, we're here with Richard Florida and Penny Amabordina. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the future of cities. Uh, does COVID mean that we're going to see the end of cities or perhaps the dawn of a new era? Um, so our conversation today is going to last 45 minutes. Um, we have a couple of panelists with very busy schedules. So if you've been to any of our previous events, it's going to be a little bit shorter. We are going to take questions in the last 10 minutes. You can enter a question at any time using the Q&A function. That's going to be at the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer. If you're on a mobile, it's going to be on the upper right hand corner. Uh, feel free to use the chat function if you'd like, but if you'd like the panelists to answer a question, please make sure to use the Q&A function. Um, and with that, I'm just going to go straight into the introductions of our panelists. So Penny Abby Wardina um, is the Commissioner for International Affairs of New York City. As part of that role, she's the rep to the UN. Um, and maybe we can give her a little bit of a, a round of applause in our homes because uh, during the spring of 2020, she was the one responsible for making sure that we had enough uh, PPE and ventilators coming in from the UN and foreign governments. So thank you, Penny, for that. Um, before she was um, in the New York City government, she was director of the Girls and Women Integration at Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, and we are also here today with Richard Florida. Um, he's one of the world's leading urbanists. You might know him from his 2004 bestseller, The Rise of the Creative Class. Um, if you, you know, are a city dweller, if you have any gripes about unaffordability, segregation, gentrification, you might be interested in his 2017, The New Urban Crisis, and he's also the author of, I believe, six other books, uh, and also a professor at the University of Toronto, the founder of Creative Class Group, which is an advisory firm, uh, and the co-founder of the Atlantic City Lab. Uh, and of course, we are here uh, with Zachary Carabell, who's the founder of the Progress Network. Progress Network is a new nonprofit organization. We're building an idea movement for a better future together. Um, you can check us out at theprogressnetwork.org if you don't know us already. Um, in addition to being our founder, uh, Zachary writes very prolifically. You might have seen his work anywhere from time to Politico. And he is the author of several books. I think it's some, somewhere on the order of 12 or 13. Uh, the next one's coming out. <laughs> We've all lost count. The next one's coming out in a couple of months in May. It's called Inside Money, Brown Brothers Harriman and the American Way of Power. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zachary um, and the conversation's going to get going. Well, cool. thanks, Emma. And thank you, Richard and Penny for, for joining us. Um, I'm particularly excited about this discussion I'm a lifelong resident of New York and kind of a Mayberry and Manhattan way. I live seven blocks from where I grew up. I did leave the city for 11 years, which seemed like a lot of time at the time and now feels more like a wound that's healed over. So I, I care deeply about urban environments and you know, never expected, at least in my sense of the future, just like many of us never expected what has happened the past year that urban environments, which seem so incredibly vibrant and everybody, you know, Richard included and Penny have been talking about the wave of the future being mass urbanization globally and all the advantages, the advantages environmentally, because, you know, people who live in cities drive less and all the, all the reasons for that, that, that you would have a crisis that's so fundamentally uh, whacked cities at, at, their, at their weakest and strongest points. You know, people coming together is the worst form of social organization when it comes to a pandemic. And we know all this. So I think the question is, uh, there's been a lot of premature, maybe right, or maybe promiscuous declaiming of the end of urbanization as we know it, and that big cities like New York and Toronto and San Francisco and London and Paris, you name it, are a thing of the past and that the future is everybody's going to remote work, we're all going to Zoom. Uh, no one's ever going to come back to the office because now that they've discovered the, the wonders of being you know, free and easy elsewhere, or the traditional cities that have been done, did really well at the end of the 20th and into the first part of the 21st century, like New York, like San Francisco, like Chicago, like Toronto, are gonna give way to new urban centers like Boise or Austin or Miami uh, or Marseille or you know, whatever, the, whatever the metric is in whatever city and that, um, you know, that that's gonna be a permanent and tectonic shift. So I think these are kind of the questions in mind, at least for me and for, for us. Um, and I guess I wanna you know, to turn to Penny first, uh, 
and we can make this a little New York as a test case for a moment, not that New York is the center of the world, even though, you know, we all believe that it is when we're here. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you read the New York Post every day, it's as if, you know, New York has suddenly become uh, the danger zone or escape from New York, the famous mid 80s film about New York becoming a maximum security prison in a dystopian future. Um, you know, is, it, is, it, is it as bad as people say? <laughs> uh, or is the future, you know, like what, wh where are we in all this, Penny? Um, no, it's not. It's definitely not that bad. I have um, been here since last March. And, you know, to, to reflect on a point that you made, um, you know, I work with the largest diplomatic corps in the world and something that ambassadors and foreign representatives from all, all over the world were sharing last March is that they never thought New York City would become the front line. And that's what happened last spring. Um, you know, we had days in which we had up to 5,000 positive test cases, about 800 New Yorkers, neighbors who were dying a day. It was a really extraordinary moment. And Zachary, I think you and I were talking, we, we were both here. Um, we actually live a few blocks away from each other, you know, and we saw the city shut down. Um, and what it also did in that period was also sort of unveil what we knew was already plaguing our society, but it became just so front and center. And it was just the inequity and the burden of what who, of who was being impacted by COVID-19. You know, people think about New York City in the sense of Manhattan, but we have five boroughs here. And we saw them, um, we saw our black and brown communities getting, being decimated by this virus, but that has so much to do with everything, everything structurally from access to education and healthcare um, to, you know, to just the underserved aspects of these communities. And so um, we have had a very long year um, in rebuilding and there have been some very positive signs. And I, I have to say, um, part of this is looking at it as an opportunity. Perhaps the Marseilles and the Austins are also gonna have an opportunity, but we also know that the strength of New York City um, is being rebuilt right now. And part of it is having the ability to um, circumvent some of the bureaucracy that prevented some of these accelerations um, previous, to, previous to COVID. So everything here in New York City is open something. There is open streets, open restaurants. Now we have open culture. And this is something where I believe there are about 35 like local pieces you know, of, of policy that had to be circumvented to allow open streets and so and open restaurants. But the fact that you see the city coming back, in fact, I was just reading a piece about how Times Square is starting to come back. And it's really because of the draw of the restaurants and the open aspect of Times Square right now. And so I fundamentally think that, um, you know, cities are coming back, they're coming back in a different way, which is what I think Richard and I are, are here to talk about. But it at the heart of it, we, we need our cities um, and we are being very innovative in terms of how we're rebuilding them. Um, and I'm seeing that in terms of not only of what we're doing here in New York City, but through all of our connections with foreign governments and other cities and states in terms of how, how cities around the world are reimagining their public spaces um, and the way that we're thinking about the role of climate in this conversation. How are we rebuilding a little bit um, more strategically? And so I fundamentally think uh, cities are here to stay. I think we're gonna come back smarter and stronger and more thoughtful um, to our most underserved communities. And that's something I'd love to talk about later. I mean, that's a perfect kind of iteration of, uh, of the, the crisis twined with opportunity reality, right? That, you mm -hmm. know, yes, this has been a crisis, but what's the opportunity? So Richard, you've been looking at the, the life cycle of cities forever. Um, and even though I, I, I created the Progress Network to look at solutions and look at the fact that we're going to construct a future and it's better to try to construct a better future than a worse one you know it, it, it would be honest at least to look at the the negative case scenario so what do you do about all these office buildings in toronto and new york and places that essentially have been constructing themselves literally for a densely packed commuter urban environment i mean is is that potentially going to change not so for the better Big, big time. But, but first, let me say, let me say one thing um, for everyone listening in or viewing. I am an addictive reader of the New York Post. And I both, uh, I, I think I apologize for that. It's literally the first thing I read. And, and that's because I'm from Newark. 
um, and grew up in Newark and read the Star Ledger. My mom worked, took ads at the Star Ledger. And, you know, I'm a fan of New York sports teams, but I mean, I read the news, I read the sports, I read page six and I read real estate. And, and I think the post has been turning around, Zach. I actually think there's now some stories that say, well, well, wait a minute. Like it's not all gloom and doom and the real estate market's bouncing back. So if the post is turning around on this, uh, you know, maybe there's a glimmer of hope. Um, the other thing is, you know, I very kindly said, you know, I've studied urbanism for a long time in, in for 40 years. I mean, it, I don't feel like it's been that long, but it has been. Um, I was born in Newark during a pandemic. Mom and dad never mentioned the fact that I was born during a pandemic. Mom and dad were born in the 1920s, but they're like the youngest kids in their family. So all my aunts and uncles were born during the Spanish flu, not a single mention. So, you know, I went back and spent like a lot of last March and April reading the history of pandemics and realized that I had never confronted this in 40 years of study as an urbanist. I, I never heard about it. We never, I mean, we talked about like light laws for light and ventilation in New York City, but that was about it. And maybe, you know, there was a park created after a pandemic in London, but nobody really talked about this. So it tells me that urbanization is stronger than pandemics, pestilence or infectious disease. But I think you nailed something. I think the big change, everyone's talking about like, where are people gonna live? Are they gonna leave New York? Are they gonna go to the Hamptons or Hudson or Nashville or Austin or Miami or where Bozeman? The geography of residence, I think is a small part of what we, we can talk more about that. It's the geography of work that's gonna change. And I actually think that this remote working thing is a big deal. Now, look, not everybody's gonna re work remotely. We're all gonna go back to the office some part of the time, but we're talking about an increase say in full-time remote workers from about 5% before the pandemic to 20% after the pandemic, with another 30% of us are all or so working remotely like part of the time, a day, two, three days a week. That's gonna decrease demand for central office space for sure. Now, I think New York will be better because it's bigger and it will attract, we can come back. I think New York's gonna attract some global companies to it because of the restrictions around the rest of the world. But I think, you know, the Detroits and Cleveland's and Pittsburgh's and maybe the Dallas's and Houston's will take a bigger hit. But I think, you know, just echoing what you and Penny said, I think those neighborhoods were the neighborhoods urbanists always complained about. They were the one dimensional, kind of nine to five, not vibrant. They're the kind of things Jane Jacobs said, you know, that's not the right way to make a neighborhood. I think we have, Penny said this, we have an opportunity to rebuild those neighborhoods with more housing, more people, with an eye towards inclusivity, with an eye towards affordable, you know, let's not give real estate developers a big break, you know, Great that Governor Cuomo says we can convert buildings, but you know, highest and best use, folks. A commercial office tower is worth less than a residential tower, right? A residential tower commands more price per square foot than an office tower. Let's take that gain and convert some of it into affordable. And let me just say one other thing. When people complain about the death of New York to me, I always say the same thing. And Penny, you might get a kick out of this. New York would be my first choice as a place to live, but it's really expensive. If, if most people around this country could get a four or five bedroom apartment or townhouse in New York for the price of a place they can get in Houston and Dallas, people would be flooding into New York City. It, it, you couldn't keep them out. So part of the big problem in New York is not the pandemic. It's just that it's really expensive. And hopefully this pandemic, as Penny said, combined with good public policy, will make it more affordable for artists, creatives, families, essential workers to live in New York. Well, I mean, I certainly, you know, hope so. I mean, I wonder for both of you what uh, what the future is, because you alluded to this, Penny, in terms of one of the things that got unlocked during the crisis was the awareness uh, of regulatory frameworks precluding nimble adaptation to needs, uh, particularly sudden needs. And that once you kind of loosen that framework, you'll find that a lot of people will, will, will create their own solutions. Um, you know, propane lamps, which were illegal, and then suddenly they weren't, which is a huge portion of facilitating outdoor dining. And that's been true throughout, you know, throughout the Western world, not just New York. Um, do you, either of you believe or think that, that there will be an urban bureaucratic shift to reconceive what the purpose of regulations are, which is presumably to make sure it's a more livable place for its inhabitants? Um, or is this going to be a uh, are you gonna have a bureaucratic counter reaction? Like, yes, we let things go for a little while, but now we're gonna reassert the rules as they were. I hope that's not the case because the other way to take what you just said and turn it around is that we've proven that 
you can be nimble, you can be put, you know, essentially have your back up against the wall and recognize you have to act in these ways and do it in a safe way. So while we had to circumvent some of these regulations, we didn't do this um, in a way that is gonna increase harm to our environment or to our community, right? That, that is how you can see the bureaucratic, you know, a blowback happening. I think part of this has been, it, you know, being in government, what I have seen in addition to the circumvention of, you know, certain, um, some of this bureaucracy is that you're seeing better um, um, connectivity and collaboration amongst agencies. So within internal city, so the way that sanitation and DOT are working with our small business services, but also then how we're working as a city with the private sector, with community organizations. I mean, COVID has really required this focus on partnerships and everybody in it together that I hope post COVID, um, what we reflect on is the value of that and more increased um, investment in that infrastructure for success. Yeah, let me, let me chime in. You know, I've done some research on this, as boring and, and wonky as I am. And I looked at car ownership. And what stimulated me to do that was when Toronto had the crack mayor, Rob Ford, and I couldn't understand, you know, and then I said, if Donald Trump could never get elected in the United States, because only Toronto could elect Rob Ford. Well, there goes that. But um, I wanted to know why a place like Toronto would elect a mayor like Rob Ford. And it, it turned out that car ownership was a primary determinant in people's voting. And I looked at that in the United States and sure enough, you know, do you own a car and commute to work? Does that matter? Um, so yeah, I think there's gonna be blowback, but I don't think it's gonna be bureaucratic. I think it's gonna be popular blowback by car owners. Look, I think the good news is that mayor, the mayor of Paris, Anne Hildago, you know, a non-trivial figure, what is arguably, even though I love New York and it's my kind of hometown, the most beautiful and elegant cosmopolitan city in the world, when she says, we're gonna remake Paris away from the car, we're gonna get cars off our street and we're gonna create a series of these complete communities or 15 minute neighborhoods where people can work, live, shop, eat. I think that's a big deal and it signals something that cities really, the, I mean, you said this, you know, people are, we know this. For the first time in my life, and I wrote a whole book called Who's Your City, people are taking where they live seriously. Like, even if they're not moving, they're going, well, you know, would I be better off here, there, or the other place? Should I look at a smaller town? Should I move from New York to the suburbs or the rural areas? Could I go? What would it be like if I went to Bozeman, you know? So people are thinking about this. And what that suggests is the competition for talent is going to be harder for cities. So what are people looking for? Livable places, safe streets, place to walk and bike, to shop, to raise their kids, with good schools nearby. So look, I, I think that certain cities are going to be better to adapt to that than others. You know, I think Toronto's having a tougher time. I love Toronto. It's in back of me right here. I think Toronto has a lot more of a constituency because it's an amalgamated city that amalgamated its suburbs that are saying, we want the right to drive our car. And, you know, we, we don't care. Miami, you know, it's gotten a lot of hype now. We spend the winters in Miami. Good luck getting cars off the street in a place like Miami. Or you can say the same thing about Los Angeles, another city I love. So I think some cities will do more. But when a city like Paris, a pretty good city, you know, anyone would say Paris is up there as a good city, says we're going to make this kind of our bread and butter. I think that's going to put pressure on other places to follow suit. I want to, I want to ask you on this. And then, Penny, you can delicately address this, given that you're in the midst of a city government right now. Um, Richard can indelicately address it because he's a free radical. Um, Indeed. Therefore, you know, I shall not be agreeing with Richard at all. <laughs> so there was there was a whole tendency in the '90s to look at oh you know what what these incredible mayors were doing you know like Giuliani getting credit for reduction of crime except for the fact that every city in the Western world saw exactly the same crime reduction patterns irrespective of who was mayor Democrat Republican a name you knew a name you didn't know um, mayor of Miami right now is you know has done a really good job trying to reach out to, to the community, you know, calling business leaders, calling local communities, you know, being a convener. Other city governments have done that much, much less well, or at least much less evidently. So I guess the question is, does city leadership matter in these trends? Are these kind of big, big trends like the 90s where crime was going down, you know, it didn't seem to matter what, who was mayor or who was in city government. Um, are we in a similar phase where like these are kind of tech, these are trends that are transcend leadership and city hall or are there cities that seem to have actually gotten COVID and or economic revitalization on the other side of it particularly right because they're really well led. 
And Richard, you have to take this one because I mean, Penny. <laughs> I mean, I'll, Penny, I'll, I'll you know, answer that. <laughs> I thought you wanted to go with the risky Sorry. first. Look, I <laughs> no, no, you can, you can, you, you can figure put, out how you want to answer that. After. The issue you put on the table is a really important one. It's difficult to talk about. Um, there's a man named David Milner who just sent me a thing he wrote. He's a downtown expert called Downtown Disc on Downtown Discontent. And uh, I'll send it around. I'll send the link to it if folks want to read it. But basically, it's arguing that one of the biggest things threatening our cities is discontent. And that discontent has been expressed in rising crime, uh, importantly, in a wave of civil protest, Black Lives Matter protests, which were very important to register the huge amount of racial and economic inequity and injustice in our society. Uh, but, but there has been an uptick in crime, no matter what you look at, violent crime, property crime. That's not just in New York, that's in New York, that's in Miami, that's in Toronto. We saw in our neighborhood a wave of car theft that we had never seen in Toronto. Um, we see it in the suburbs. You hear about it in suburban malls. So look, you know, I'm, I talked to the other mayor of Miami yeah, the other day, Daniela Levine Cava, who's a remarkable person. And she called it like COVID stir crazy. She's like, we got to start talking about COVID stir crazy. There is something going on that we can't put our finger on, which is really important. And we got to deal with, we got to put it on the table and we got to deal with it. And, and we know Penny, Penny, we know how to deal with it. It's, it's a, a legacy of inequity, of racial injustice, of pent up emotion, of mental health. We can, and we, we have to put that on the table. I think it's a big deal. Look, do I think leadership matters? Yeah, big time. And leadership matters more than ever. And you know, Mayors across this country and the world are saying we have to build back better. The, you know, what does that mean? Inclusive, sustainable, resilient, safe. The UN made a whole sustainable development goal about those things. The problem is cities don't have the resources to do it, right? I mean, cities are broke. There's been a fit. This, the, everything we talked about has caused a fiscal crisis of cities. So this is where Biden comes in. Boy, lucky we got that right. And this, this bailout that we're talking about has to enable cities to cope with these problems. If not, then we'll be in a difficult situation. But these are big, Penny said this, and these are big structural problems that have always been there that COVID exposes that we have to deal with, but we need federal, we need some other assistance to do it. Cities can't, don't have the resources to do this on their own. So I don't actually largely disagree with that, Richard. <laughs> um, I think honestly what I, COVID didn't happen in a void. COVID hit uh, during four tumultuous years of a federal government that, pretty much abdicated its responsibility on every issue from broad migration to climate change. And so, you know, something that we have witnessed, something that we have led on, at least from in New York City with other um, cities around the US and around um, the globe have just been that local government does matter. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think most Americans appreciated how important their mayor and their governor were in their everyday life. And so there has been a significant shift, I think, and then COVID just essentially brought it home. And I was like, oh, shoot, how are we going to, how are we going to teach our kids? We have neighborhoods that don't have tablets. How do you go online if there's not enough bandwidth, broadband bandwidth or access to tablets, right? And so suddenly it became a very visceral um, reality, I think, for our communities in terms of how important local government is. And so that you know, leadership does matter, but a lot of this also leads to how are we learning from others? And so over the last few years, I think cities in particular, I mean, we have worked from New York City, have worked with Paris and London extremely closely on a number of different issues. In fact, Paris replicated our IDNYC program there in Paris. And IDNYC was to ensure that all residents, irrespective of their documentation status, had an ID card that they could navigate New York City with which included accessing health services, right? And so this is this is just highlighted, not only I think the importance of local governments, but how we work and talk and collaborate with each other. This has this is not a time for what's new. It is like, what is working? How is it working? And how can I um, ampli yeah, you know, amplify that and replicate that in my community as soon as possible? And so that's the, that's the part of local government and leadership that we get to build on right now. Obviously, every city has a different context, but I know in New York City, um, you know, in 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 relating with the pre-COVID reality of the Trump administration, which then during COVID wrote off cities, New York City in particular, there's a reason that my team and I and my colleagues were seeking PPE from foreign governments. We weren't getting it from ours, and so. I do think that, you know, local government leadership is extremely important. 
So I want to mention one other thing to build on what Penny said that I think folks listening in might be interested in. I think we're seeing partly a race to the bottom being instigated by certain folks who don't like cities. Zach, you mentioned that, that there's been this mantra about city decline and, and urban exodus. There's also been a mantra about peeing, people fleeing badly governed cities like New York and San Francisco. First of all, these are the cities that did the best job of managing the pandemic of any. Th those two cities, like it or not, have done empirically the best job of managing the pandemic and dealing with public health and coping with the crisis. So when people talk about bad governance or problematic governance in these places, what do they mean? High taxes. That's what they mean. You cut through the bullshit. What these kind of right-wing finance types and investor types and techies, you know, these are libertarian techies and DCs from San Francisco. Oh my God, what are they talking? And, and Trump did one here. He eliminated that salt deduction. The, the, the ability to deduct on your income tax, the state and local taxes. So what do you got now? You've got a bunch of rich people and I wrote a whole piece on this for City Lab. a bunch of rich people, the 0.001% that are saying, we don't like it in New York and San Francisco anymore because they make us pay too much taxes and they don't let us do whatever the hell we want. They regulate us and they make us provide affordable housing. We'll go to Miami. We'll go to Austin. Look, that's a race to the bottom. And let's call a spade a spade. That is a race to the bottom. And what terrifies me is that we, we praise this in the sense of, you know, all the blooming of a thousand flowers of new tech hubs and look at what's happening. But the reality is it is an instigated anti-urban race to the bottom. And that's something all of us have to be seriously committed to. Look, we need better uh, public health policies. We need higher minimum wages. We need better social welfare policies. We need better, we need police reform and more spending on mental health, not less. And, and so this whole mantra about cities are declining because they tax us and regulate us too much. It's just something people have to begin to pull apart at the seams. You know, um, first, I would encourage people to use the Q&A function. So if you want a question in, in, in the last part of this, pipe it into the Q&A and I'll see it or we'll see it. Um, so to echo that point, Richard, it's always interesting to try to look at statistical realities behind headlines. You know, city, people are fleeing. Cities are being hollowed out. Uh, according to a Reuters analysis, and Penny will know this, the net outflows from New York City as of January of 2021 is 70,000 people. Right? New York City is a city of 8.3 million people. 70,000 people is 0.87%. I mean, whether that's droves or not, I don't know, but not, not necessarily. And, and you can do similar numbers for San Francisco. The migration out of San Francisco has actually been into the Bay Area. Um, so you could make some argument maybe that San Francisco proper yeah, is, is, is problematic. Um, I do want to push you, in, and I'm curious about Penny around this. Uh, there is a question, though, whether or not money is really what's needed. Because, again, the thing about the street regulations for dining, that required zero public funds. That just required a city government facilitating something as a, as a, at, the, at the nexus of private and public. Uh, I remember years ago meeting the mayor of Bogota right after the kind of the end of the worst of the civil war, although before the Colombian civil war was fully over. And he, he was one of the early advocates of bike lanes and, and biking, but that was probably done because there was a, there was no public transportation infrastructure. So biking was like at the cheapest way yep. to facilitate people getting around. So, you know, I wonder, I mean, maybe you're, maybe we can place too much emphasis on the need for money and not enough on the need for sort of, the community innovation. No, we need the money. <laughs> well, we are going to be we, getting we need some the money. And and the Biden and yeah, for the entirety of last year, the mayor, I think, in every press conference, you know, appealed to the Trump administration for some kind of stimulus, some kind of support. It is such a relief to have the Biden Harris stimulus coming down the pipe. Thank God for that. Um, it's probably still not gonna be enough. Um, and that is what is the real concern. Um, I don't think there's a sil silver bullet out there. Um, I think the options that are, um, you know, sort of out there in terms of can cities borrow, there's so much politics wrapped up in that that are decades old. Um, I don't have the, the, the glass, whatever that thing is called to be able to predict the future, but we need money. The Biden-Harris is our first step. Um, and thank God for that stimulus, but there's a lot more that's needed. Yeah, well, I mean, I wrote a piece, I wrote a piece for Time last week saying, you know, let cities yes. borrow. So I mean, anyway, Richard. 
I think it's both. I think I think both more money is needed and more ingenuity is needed. Sure. Um, what's interesting is you mentioned Mayor Suarez, and we interviewed him on our podcast called The Mayors, and he said something really interesting. I, I never, I always get Republican mayors wrong. So he's a Republican. <laughs> I didn't know that, but he is a Republican. And he said this was. We talked to him before Biden took office. He had been elected. He said he had talked to Biden more times on calls with mayors than he did with the entirety of the Trump administration. Holy, that's a big deal that a Republican mayor of a major city was on more calls with Biden before he took office than he was with Trump. So that, that, that's important. So th this new bond between cities and the federal government, I think is going to strengthen it. That's going to be, I don't, I always resist these new deal things, but like the new deal created a kind of bond between cities and the feds. I think we're going to renew that bond now. But I think it's money and ingenuity. And I, I want to say something as someone who lives a good part of the time in Canada that I learned about America. We have this public-private partnership thing going on in America that nobody else has. And you look at New York and people look at how the civic structure, whether you agree, Penny, whether you agree with some of their complaints, it's neither here nor there, we can talk about that. But look at how the business community is coming together and saying, we want to unify around, we need to rebuild New York. I'm not saying everything they say is good, but you see this in Pittsburgh, you see it in Milwaukee, you see it in Toledo, you see it in Dayton, you see it in Phoenix. And you see it where there's large local philanthropies. Like I work with the Kaiser Family Foundation in Tulsa, the Walton Family Foundation in Bentonville, the Mellon Foundation in Pittsburgh. Like what these public-private philanthropic partnerships are able to do, and I think part of it is engaging them more. So it's federal money, but it's also local money that doesn't come from the local government, but it comes from, and I think the, the other thing I would say is it's gotta be Metro. I think now we realize that we're in this together, city, suburb, and rural area, and I think one of the things that the bailout could do, if, if they were smart, is kind of cause these regional partnerships to be more strongly forged, public, private, philanthropic, metro-wide. I think that would be a good thing, but I think it's both money and local initiative. The one thing I want to point out um, that bring out that Richard mentioned that actually has done so much harm that we have a ways to build out of it is that the Trump administration, it wasn't a party thing. They really didn't seem to appreciate the responsibility that they had as a federal government to the states and local governments. And that that's four years of that, um, of that disconnect between agencies and funding towards our local governments. And then COVID just heightened that. So it's rebuilding from that bit too. That's that's gotten us in, you know, quite a long ways to go. And do either of you look at in the past year, I mean, are there any cities that stand out as if, if we're going to talk about leadership matters, are, are there cities that have stood out in your mind that, sure. that have managed this crisis in, for whatever they can control versus what they can't? In a other than New York good fashion, City? Other than New York City, globally, not just, not, not just within the United States. Yeah. We, we already mentioned Paris as one. Yeah. Helsinki's yeah. been very strong. Yeah. And, and, and what about them? What, what, what has been strong about that? Like, what's the, what's the lesson or the, the, the model? You well, I know, think shifting towards residents and neighborhoods away from the central business district and understanding that cities are for their residents and their people. Penny, sorry. No, it's right. I mean, they, they launched, I think, what a bunch of cities have tried to do a version of, which is that 15 minute city, a version of that without calling it. But how do you contain your community? And this is, you know, this is where there's some short term um, <laughs> opportunity in terms of workforce development. But COVID is not over. We are having this conversation still in the midst of a pandemic, right? So between test and trace and vaccination, you still need to have um, communities that are not traveling very far to do everything from getting to work, teaching their kids, dropping off their dry cleaning. And so because of that, that has really addressed um, the way that I think certain cities and Helsinki has been a really, um, I think, standout example of this is doing that, but also doubling down on the type of climate action um, initiative that they're choosing to take right now, right? So we just keep talking about cars, but there, I think there are more aspects to the sustainability um, climate action that cities have been taking advantage of in this COVID, this COVID period. I don't know, Richard, have you seen yeah, that? One thing that has surprised me a lot, and, and one thing I'm worried about is that there are very few cities that are developing post-COVID strategies. And that's because it's all hands on deck to deal with COVID. Right. But I think now is, the, and I've been arguing this since last March or April, that we need strategies for economic development post-COVID because things are not, there's going to be a new normal. Mm -hmm. I think things are gonna be much more distributed around 15 minute communities and we need actual strategies to cope with that. 
the, I work with two places, so I'll, useful to disclose, that I think have done a very good job of this. I think Tulsa has been all over this. Now, the reason Tulsa has been all over this is it has the Kaiser, George Kaiser Foundation. And this Kaiser Foundation is very smart. They said, how can Tulsa position to thrive? They did this before the pandemic and said, we have to attract remote workers. But it's not just about giving the grant to attract remote workers. It's about how do we build a remote work ecosystem? What do we invest in in terms of co-working, in terms of coffee shops, in terms of affordable housing? They're now thinking about, they'll hate me for saying this on air, but they're now thinking about, do we build a remote worker bill of rights? They're thinking a long term about, and, and the other one is Bentonville, where I work closely with the Walton Family Foundation. I mean, while Amazon decided to leave Seattle, the Walton Family Foundation decided that it would invest in Bentonville. And they are thinking long and hard about not just how you make Bentonville a place that's a wonderful place to live with art museums and bike trails. How do you build it back in an inclusive and resilient way? Now, the, the two differentiating facts are wealthy local foundation, right? Th that not every community has that, but we can begin to think of other assets that can enable other communities to do that. So I believe what Penny says, in order to prosper on the other side of this, you not only need natural advantages, you need strategic strategy and intentionality. And I, New York will be fine because it's the center of the universe. But if you're a smaller town, you need strategy and intentionality. And the ones that can muster that will be relatively better positions than the one that can't. I mean, I mean, to some degree, right? Uh, Bentonville as a model for Sao Paulo, New York, Mumbai is you know, it's useful, but it's probably not that indicative in, in the same way that Americans who go, why can't we be more like New Zealand? Well, because we're not four and a half million people in the middle of nowhere, that's two islands. You know, it's, it, I mean, there, there are things you can learn, but you can't replicate those, you can't transpose the, the physical realities of those structures on, on to us. Um, I, I don't, I, I want to, I want to ask a negative question and then we can maybe end on a more, you know, positive note. I mean, cities do have life bands, right? There are cities that wind down either because the industrial base does. And we have examples in the United States where, you know, well before the pandemic, places like Cleveland, Detroit's an open question, whether there's a core there that could be viable, Buffalo, Rochester, um, uh, Toledo, uh, Midland cities in the UK, uh, industrial cities, Lille, you know, I mean, it, there, is a, there is a life cycle here. Um, is should one always fight that? I mean, it one city's loss is not necessarily the overall society's loss. Well, and that churn happens among second and third tier cities. It is really hard to displace a New York or a London. Look at Berlin. Look at the stuff Berlin has been through. I mean, bombed, Nazi occupation, partitioned, and Berlin is still one of the 10 most interesting cities in the world. So at the top, it's hard to kill a city, but you're right. Those second and third tier cities, there's a lot of churn. And I think, Zachary, you, you, this is something you've written a lot about. I think we're still playing out the end of deindustrialization. I think this is, the, you know, 2008 was part of that. It began in the 80s, but 2008 hit hard at the manufacturing belts of, the, of Europe and the United States. And I think when you look at it, we're still playing out the end of deindustrialization, that there is a shift away from industrial to knowledge, whatever, creative, innovative, all those words. And that's playing out. And I think in ways, what we're seeing in the central business district is also the end of an industrial way of organizing the office. So yeah, and, and what's really heart rendering in all of this is that the industrialization decimates and, and Pittsburgh and Detroit may be able to survive it because they're big. But I mentioned, you mentioned Buffalo, Toledo, Akron, the small uh, Weirton, West Virginia, Youngstown. Boy, those are places that that we need big strategies to rebuild and, and just to stabilize. You know, there's a fellow at the Upjohn Institute, Tim Bartek, if anyone's interested, who spent a lot of time agonizing about this and argues that with strategic use of block grants, real strategic use of block grants, the federal government could help make that happen. But it seems to me that's a big agenda item that we need to really talk about under this new administration. Hmm. And that's um, and that was that's a fair point. And in American context, I will say, given the work that I do and the the, the perspective that my agency has with other cities and states around the world, we actually, instead of focusing on that, want to figure out how to help them survive, if not thrive. And, you know, somebody mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, which is this UN framework, but, you know, how you can help um, secondary, third cities, um, you know, survive, thrive, 
is about this exchange of ideas and being able to help them um, accelerate what they're doing and strategies, whether it's related to sustainability or access to quality education. And we use this SDG framework. Um, you know, we, I mean, this is, this gets super wonky, but the UN, you know, has 193 countries that agreed to this framework back in 2015. New York City mapped our development agenda to it, had lots of synergies. And so we've been really showcasing how we're localizing the sustainable development goals. A few years ago, we created this central movement called the Voluntary Local Review, where we invited um, cities and states around the world to be able to reflect on what they're doing locally and how they're achieving these different SDGs, and then to be able to share it into a common por uh, portal, essentially, right? There's transparency and accountability in that, as well as um, best practice exchange. And I will say in COVID, we have seen an increase in the number of cities and states who are you know, challenged with resources joining this work. We have over 220 local governments that are now part of it. And I do think that there is an effort, there is a collective of cities and states that are actively trying to support each other so that there is not this end. So yeah. that is a, that's a positivity I wanna share. It's not um, the silver bullet, but it is something we're actively working on. What Penny's saying is so important. And, and, you know, it's what Ben Barber was working on towards the end of his life with the Global Parliament of Mayors and devoting the end of his life to. Um, let me say that I think what we're going to see this summer is a level of geographic inequality that we've never seen. The U.S. will be fully vaccinated. The U.S. will be reopened. New York will be bustling. People will be traveling. And the rest of the world will be locked down and scrambling. And I've been saying this for a while. The Biden administration needs a Marshall Plan for vaccine diplomacy we have to now go out and help vaccinate the world. And that is, that is probably the single biggest thing the United States can do to remake it, not only its image, its stature, you know. Look, my dad told me stories about World War II till, he was, till I was blue in the face. He told me when he enlisted, this is a factory worker, they gave him a freaking broomstick and a doughboy helmet. And they said, go train Lou, you know, wherever at Fort Dix, wherever the hell he trained. He said, by the time he got to England, before he deployed to Normandy, the convoys of material and armaments and provisions, it was just mind boggling. You know, when I took my mother-in-law to get vaccinated, when I saw the clinic in Miami, I started to cry. And, and it, it reminded me of my dad's story about World War II mobilization. We can do this. Lord God, we can do this. And we can help the rest of the world. And Penny, if we don't do it, we're screwed. Because no, and that's, th that is a hundred percent true. And I will say that there is a global uh, um, fund for this. It's called COVAX. And that one of the first, I think one of the first, like first, like 15 things he signed um, on day one was signing up the U.S. for that. So instead of a separate Marshall Plan, what is really powerful yeah, about COVAX is that. that Biden Harris is joining um, a global community it. working on this um, because it. you're right. If everybody, I mean, that's what the secretary general says. If everyone's not vaccinated, he doesn't say it quite in this quote. Right. <laughs> Almost everyone I know in the United States who's eligible is getting a vaccine. Now, obviously, you said all things about impacted communities, Black and Hispanic communities, low income communities, not we need to. But I don't know a single person in Canada. Canada is a rich country. You think about the differential in vaccination rates between the United States of America and our, and our northern neighbor. Well, now magnify that with, with the global south. So, yeah. Yeah, this has to be a big agenda item. If not, the spatial inequality between the advantaged world, the, the tier one cities and the rest is gonna make what we have now. It's just gonna, it's gonna, it's just gonna be tra tragic. Yeah, I mean, 75% of all vaccinations today, vaccinations today have been in 10 countries, um, which represents 60% of the world's GDP, uh, but a fraction of the world's population. Uh, and that's just the way it's rolling out right now. So I know we're kind of at time. I'm glad, Richard, that you pointed out that, that, that large cities are potent ecosystems, right? I mean, I thought for a while, looking around the world, can you find any large mega city that it really has manifestly declined? Maybe Rio is an example of that. And even Rio with having lost all that it lost in terms of government and finance and the industry is still an, you know, a bizarrely vibrant, albi bizarre place. Um, it'd be great to have this conversation in a year or two, meaning to really look back and see were, were these energies unleashed in this, in this potent way? Um, I think the best hope that all of us have for urbanization is it's not zero sum. I mean, you can have multiple nodes and smaller cities thriving and larger cities thriving, uh, that it's not, you know, that may be a problem for the heartland, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem for cities. 
and that uh, making prognostications about the future in the midst of a crisis is is emotionally problematic and intellectually dicey. You know, it's like asking people when a when a building is burning to be sanguine about fire. So I'm hoping that some of the hysteria of the moment and the the forecasting of gloom and doom for cities is more of a product of the trauma and the crisis than it is indicative of, of where we're all going. But I want to thank both of you because both of you are really central, not just to yapping about this stuff, which is where I come in, but actually helping cities apply that to what are we going to do? And I think that's incumbent on all of us who, who live in urban environments and think about them. And uh, I totally want to support that work, support the work that you are both doing. And I want to thank you for joining us. All of you out there who are not yet subscribed to the Progress Network newsletter, please do so. We're trying to create some community that has a trajectory of we're all writing the future. And uh, the better we can write it, the better it's going to be for all of us. So thanks, Penny. And thanks, Richard. And thank you, as always, Emma. Thank you, Zachary. So uh, panelists, if you need to go, thank you again. You're free to go. Um, last announcement I'm going to make is that our next event is on March 11th. Uh, it's called Maybe We're Not Effed. Uh, that's <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, but it's about the climate conversation and whether the narrative of climate catastrophism is doing us any good. So you can uh, register for that event at theprogressnetwork.org slash events. And that's it for us. Uh, this recording is gonna be available online and we'll let you know about that. Thanks and have a great day. Bye.